All right, let's remember back to the person who launched this um, topic in philosophy of personal identity, which is John Locke. John Locke um, distinguished between being, as he put it, a man, and essentially he means human, and being a person. And he said, what uh, made for the same person through time is consciousness. And as we've seen, Parfit has, uh, has done a lot with that Lockean idea. And then McMahon has taken up some of um, Parfit's ideas. Uh, and, and basically, Locke introduced this idea of a person as distinct from the human being. And Locke himself discusses uh, what um, de Gracia, in the reading for today, uh, calls criteria of identity. And criteria of identity are essentially what it is that makes uh, one thing now the same thing as, as earlier. What is it that makes, um, uh, so for example, what does it makes, makes me now the same as me when I was five? That would be my criteria of identity. And Locke points out in a, an incredibly influential chapter in his monumental essay on human understanding, points out that there are different criteria of identity for different kinds of things. So for example, the criteria of identity for a lump of stuff is simply it must be made of the same atoms. So is this the same lump of stuff as earlier? Well, does it have the same atoms? If it's uh, lost an atom or added an atom, then it isn't the same lump of stuff. And Locke points out that if those were the criteria of identity for us, then obviously we're not the same from moment to moment because we lose cells all the time. So he said uh, different things have different criteria of identity. And he pointed out that living things like plants or animals obviously can't have these criteria of identity because living things are like, as one person put it, a slow motion fountain. We bring in a new material and we lose uh, material all the time. So what makes, say, uh, the tree in my backyard the same as when it was a sapling? What, what makes it the same tree? And he said it shares a common life. So there is a life that the, tr the tree is alive now in, in the sense that it has a life. And the life is what kind of organizes it. Um, what, what is it that takes in new cells? Uh, the, the cells become part of the tree when they become part of this life uh, that dates back to the beginning of the organism. So he said the criteria of identity for man, because man is an organism too, is life. So same life, same uh, human. Contrast that with person. With person, the criteria of identity are consciousness. Okay, so uh, Locke makes this distinction and he doesn't actually say that we are one or the other except in uh, his famous uh, example of the prince and the cobbler that you see de, Graz de Grazia mentioning which is the case of where uh, a, a prince's consciousness g somehow gets swapped with a cobbler's so that the, uh, the prince goes to sleep in his palace and then when he opens his eyes, he's in the cobbler's body in the cobbler's cottage and, you know, wonders what the hell is happening. And uh, this thought experiment is a very powerful way to get us to decide that what we are most essentially is the person, because uh, you have a choice. If you believe that we are the human, then you would say that the prince is still in the prince's body. He just thinks he's the cobbler now. But that's the prince. The prince hasn't uh, changed. The prince is uh, defined by his body. He's just confused now because he thinks he's the cobbler. Uh, whereas if you believe that what we are essentially is the person, then we would say the prince now has switched bodies and uh, has the cobbler's body. So this is a good test of intuitions, and whenever I give this example to students, they always say, oh, they've switched bodies. So it seems like, intuitively, the psychological account that says we are essentially persons 
is what most people believe. However, not everybody. And uh, in recent years, something called animalism has made a comeback. And animalisms essentially take the man side of the equation or human. They say, no, uh, we are not essentially persons, we are essentially human organisms. And the people pushing this view tend to approach it uh, from a, a different direction from the people like Parfit who push a psychological account, or uh, even McMahon uh, who pushes a slightly different version but still says that, the, that uh, psychology is very important. Both McMahon and um, Parfit are primarily interested in ethical concerns. And in fact, uh, one of the contributions, one of the many contributions Locke made was to point out that ethical concerns seem to be wrapped up with the person. So Locke, for example, talks about, um, you know, suppose somebody uh, commits a crime uh, but then forgets all about it. They have, no they have no psychological connection to the person that committed the crime. But, you know, they have the same body. So, for example, the police come and, you know, the body is covered with blood and has left fingerprints at the scene. Should we punish that human being who obviously committed the crime? And Locke says, no, if it's not the same person. What matters for purposes of, uh, of punishment and responsibility is the person and not the animal. Okay, so ethical concerns seem to sort of side with the, uh, the personalism, the person view. But the people who are pushing animalism seem to come at it from uh, a metaphysical view. They are concerned with the question, what kinds of stuff are there in the world? And uh, what kind of thing are we? And when you approach it from that angle, as, um, as writers, some of the writers who, who have argued for an animalist account, uh, famously a guy called Peter van Inwagen is one of these, and uh, a sort of um, follower of Peter van Inwagen who has done perhaps the most to push animalism is a guy called Eric Olson who I've interviewed. I've interviewed McMahon. I've interviewed Eric Olson. He's also, like McMahon, he's an American based in Britain um, for some reason because they pay them less over there. I guess they like the National Health Service. Um, but yeah, he, he comes from a sort of uh, a metaphysics background. And they have some kind of rather ingenious arguments for suggesting that it just cannot be the case that what we are essentially is, um, is persons. Uh, what we are essentially, what we are at, a, at our most basic level is uh, a human being, a, an organism, an animal. All right, uh, how does de Gracia argue for this? Well, um, I'm going to... Uh, read from his section, why take essentialism seriously? So essentialism is the idea that we are uh, most basically what our essence is, what our essential properties are. And this notion of an essential property comes from primarily from the great philosopher Aristotle, uh, who, you know, lived over 2,000 years ago. And Aristotle uh, like all the ancient Greeks, was obsessed with the problem of change. And change is a puzzle because change requires two things that seem contradictory. One, things have got to be different. So if change has happened uh, uh, over a, a period of time, then what was here must be different from what's here. Okay, so there must be difference. But for there to be change, there also must be similarity. That is, it must be, for something to have changed, it must be the same thing that was here that is here. Because otherwise you haven't got change, you've just got replacement. You've just got one thing here and you've replaced it with something new. But change requires that the same thing is now different. So you've got these two elements, sameness and difference. 
How do you accommodate that? It, it, it's kind of a puzzle. Aristotle's solution is to say that a thing has two different kinds of properties. You've got a substance that has properties, and the properties are either essential or what he called accidental, or what we translated as accidental. Accidental properties are features of you that you happen to have but that don't define you, like hair color or something like that, or, or uh, the color of, a, of your car. Um, your car, you could spray paint your car a different color, and it would still be your car. So therefore, its color is not essential to it, because an essential property is one that if it changes, you've no longer got the original thing. All right, so what we are is determined by our essential properties. Um, now, is being uh, conscious an essential property of me, such that if consciousness were to go away entirely, I would cease to exist. That is the view of pers what uh, de Grazia calls personalism, or person essentialism. That says, my essential property is being conscious such that if there's a thing there that is not conscious, or, and, is not, uh, a, a, and you have to be careful here, you have to say has the capacity for conscious, because obviously I could be in a coma and I'm still there. So I'm not actually conscious right now, but I still have the capacity for consciousness. But of course, when I'm a zygote or an embryo, I don't have the capacity for consciousness. So literally, according to personalism, I was never a fetus. And de Grazia calls this problem for personalism, which is a view like Parfit's that says we are essentially conscious. Um, he says that's a problem because most people would say, would talk about when I was conceived or when, my, when I was inside my mother. Uh, you could be careful when you say that. Uh, when I was a fetus in my mother's womb, uh, that seems like a perfectly acceptable way of talking. Um, but according to personalism, that can't have been me because I only exist where there's a capacity for consciousness and the fetus doesn't have that, the brain hasn't developed enough yet. Similarly, someone in persistent vegetative state, uh, famous case like in, in the George W. Bush era was this woman, Terry Schiavo, who was, uh, it turned out, brain dead and her parents claimed that she wasn't brain dead and her husband said that she was, turns out that she was, that her, her um, cerebella had liquefied, so she no longer had the apparatus for being for consciousness. According to personalism, Terry Schiavo was gone at that point, because what she is most essentially is a person, and persons are by definition conscious. In fact, they're by de definition self-conscious, according to Locke and people after Locke. And obviously she wasn't uh, she was not even conscious, let alone self-conscious. Um, whereas we would say they buried Terry Schiavo, you know, she, uh, that's Terry Schiavo there, she's in a persistent vegetative state. So the way we talk seems to give the lie to personalism, and it seems to support animalism, because uh, Terry Schiavo is still a living organism, even when her cerebella are, are liquid. Um, and if what she is most essentially is uh, a, an organism, a human animal, then that makes sense. So furthermore, another problem with person essentialism is it implies that we are not animals. And uh, Olsen in particular has made much play of a related problem that this, that this leads to the too many thinkers problem or uh, what in their article uh, sort of attacking animalism, um, uh, Jeff McMahon and uh, Tim Campbell call the too many subjects argument, uh, criticism. I will uh, just read from you um, uh, a, a basic summary of the problem. Uh, if I can find it in my notes, that, put it this way, 
suppose you're sitting down right now watching this video. You are sitting in a chair, but you are not an animal according to personalism. You are a person. But there's an animal sitting in that chair too, a human organism, and it's not you. So there are two people, there are two, uh, th there are two things that are sitting in that chair. Now, is the animal conscious? Well, uh, it would seem to be a very weird thing to deny that the animal is conscious. We have evolutionary theories of how uh, how humans developed consciousness. We have, we certainly uh, believe that non-human animals are conscious, that they are aware of their surroundings, that they they have sensations. That's all that consciousness requires. So why should humans be any different? Um, animals are capable of consciousness. Humans definitely seem to be the same thing. If you are not one and the same with uh, with an animal, then the thing that is not you must be there independently of you and it's sitting in the chair with you and it's thinking thoughts because it's conscious too. So suppose you think, uh, get to the point Cushing, you're having that thought. Well, who's having that thought? It seems like you're having that thought because you're a conscious person, but there's also a conscious animal there that is also having that thought. So the thought is being had by two different thinkers. And there's a related problem to this uh, that comes up that uh, Campbell and McMahon bring, bring up, and, and it's sort of in response to Lynn Rudder Baker's view. So, um, yeah, let's get to uh, uh, Lynn Rudder Baker's view. But first, let me explain this. According to um, animalism, our substance is, uh, is animal. That is, uh, the thing we are most basically, the thing that remains through change is an animal. Now the animal can develop and change in many respects. And in fact, um, according to animalists, we do go through a person phase. So animalists don't deny that persons exist. What they say about persons is that they are just a phase of the animal, just like child or teenager is a phase of an animal. So we could say, uh, point to your kid and say, well, there's a human organism and it's also a child. But which is it most essentially? Well, the human organism. The child is just a phase it's going through. And what uh, uh, animalists say is that's what persons are. So, I, first of all, I was a non-person when I was just a cluster of cells and then an embryo. And probably I, until well after my birth, I am not a person. If you, if you take the, the strict definition of pers person as uh, something that's self-conscious. Then I enter a person phase when self-consciousness arrives. And when I enter that is kind of vague, you know, how can you tell when, uh, when um, a baby is now self-conscious, it, it, it's a little bit unclear, but eventually it's obvious uh, that I'm a person. But then uh, if I'm unlucky, perhaps, well, I don't know if it's lucky or not. Suppose I live long enough to get severe advanced Alzheimer's or go into a persistent vegetative state. Then uh, I'm still alive, I'm still there as an organism, but my person stage has ended because I'm no longer self-conscious. So the animal, uh, me as the animal, both predates me as the person and postdates me as the person. Uh, the person is just a phase. Whereas what personalism says is that person is a substance because it's what I am most basically. All right, What's, what do we do about the, the too many thinkers problem? Well. Lynn Rodebaker, uh, recently deceased, I tried to interview her, but she was, um, she said she was too ill and she died shortly thereafter. So I missed my shot with, uh, with Lynn Rodebaker. She, um, she makes an analogy. Uh, and the analogy is between a statue and the stuff that comprises the statue, the bronze. And she says, uh, you have a statue and you also have the hunk of bronze. Now, 
both of them exist. Uh, but one can uh, outlast the other. For example, if I melt down the statue, the statue is gone. It ceased to exist, but the bronze is still there. So what do we say? Do we say there's, uh, there's a problem there because you've got both the bronze and the statue and you can't have two things in one place? And she says, no, that's perfectly acceptable. What we say instead is that the, um, the statue is constituted or made up of the bronze. So they're not identical though. And the reason why they're not identical is because they have different identity conditions. That is, the statue has to retain the same shape to be the same statue. That's its identity conditions. Whereas the bronze has whatever identity conditions being bronze is. I suppose if you melted it down enough so that the component, what, what is bronze? It's like copper and lead and or I'm getting it confused with brass. But anyway, it, it's an alloy. Um, and if you, you know, separated out the component metals, then the bronze would be gone, I guess. So that would be its identity conditions. But um, they have different identity conditions and that's entirely possible. So she says that the human being uh, constitutes the, um, the person. Uh, the human organism constitutes the person without being identical to her. Okay, so how does that view fare with the objections to personalism? Well, what about the fetus problem? Uh, she says that the fetus Oh, one of the, the, the questions about the fetus is, what happened to the fetus? All right, because if you're a personalist, you come into existence, um, you come into existence, let's say, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a wide conception of person, so you just need to be conscious. And probably the uh, consciousness arrives when you're still a fetus. All right. But there is something that exists that is not conscious, the pre-conscious fetus. Once you come on the scene, and, and remember, person, personalists do tend to say that, um, certainly contemporary personalists say, I'm not claiming anything weird. I'm not uh, arguing for a soul or anything like that. That's not what's conscious. What's conscious and Parfit makes this clear with his reductionist view, is this. This thing is conscious. So I am this, but what this is, is a person. Um, okay, says, uh, say the animalists, this is a person. So you've got a, a 3D object uh, uh, with, you know, a heart and everything that is a person. But before that, there was this non-person, this fetus that was not com uh, conscious. That's not you. Okay, where did it go? You popped on the scene as this fully formed organism once consciousness arrived. What happened to the thing that wasn't you? Did it pop out of existence? Where did it go? Um, see, I, I gotta say, I, I have a hard time putting the animalist position because I don't find these metaphysical issues that compelling. Um, which is, I guess, why I'm drawn to, uh, to psychological accounts, but I'm doing my best. So the question is, what happened to the fetus? Well, uh, Lynn Ryder Baker says, um, it continued to develop after it came to constitute a person. Just because two things are not identical doesn't mean they have to be separate. So she says, uh, once you have this constitution view, you don't it, it's not such a puzzle. You know, the, the fetus becomes an animal, and so the fetus doesn't vanish. It, could, it, it changes into something that is not a fetus. It then comes to constitute something different from it. Now, Olson gets very grumpy when um, he reads things like this, and he says, I just don't get the, I, this idea of constitution just doesn't make sense to me. There's either being or not being. And he, um, uh, he, he makes the complaint that, um, well, uh, he, he says, even if, suppose uh, the organism now constitutes the person, 
Well, you've still got the too many thinkers problem, it seems. And he says, and I still have an epistemological problem. I can't tell whether or not uh, who's, who's thinking what. Suppose I have the thought, says Olson, that uh, my identity conditions are uh, biological. Well, if it's the animal having that thought, then it's having a true thought because animals' identity conditions are biological. But if it's the person having that thought, then it's having a false thought because the identity conditions for persons are psychological. How would I know, though? There's no way to tell. This is an epistemological problem, a problem about uh, knowledge. Well, um, here's what uh, Lynn Rodebaker Baker says about the how many thinkers issue. She says, there's just one thinker. Both you and the human animal that constitutes you are that person, that conscious being. Now, um, oh, and also, does it, mean, does it imply that we're not animals? Well, she says, you've got to understand that the word are can be used in different senses. It can be used as identity, uh, you know, as the equal sign. Does that mean that we equal animals? And she says, well, in that sense, no, we're not animals. But there's a perfectly acceptable sense of the word are, which is constitution. And if you think of... Uh, uh, us as constituted by animals, then we are animals. We are constituted by animals. And, you know, I can already see Olson frowning at this claim. Uh, but it seems like, um, it seems like something we can at least make sense of. Now, uh, de Grazia's problem with it is more with her specific view that we are an, uh, a, a first-person perspective. So let me say a little bit about that. So um, I've been talking up to this point as if there's just kind of two theories of identity because that's what we find in Locke. There's the psychological account like Parfit's. Um, remember, Parfit responds to some of the criticisms in Locke like uh, uh, the Reed's uh, criticism of Locke that uh, Locke's theory both implies that the old general is the boy and isn't the boy because the old general doesn't directly remember being the boy. And Parfit uh, fixes that with the, you don't just, uh, rec uh, your identity is not just psychological, direct psychological connections, it's psychological continuity. And because there's psychological continuity, because the general remembers being the old soldier and the soldier remembers being the boy, that's good enough. So. Part of what Parfit does is fix problems in Locke's psychological account. But uh, there's a sort of third view, which is that we are, um, well, it's put in different ways. Uh, Parfit refers to it as a Cartesian ego. Um, but once you use the word Cartesian, it starts bringing in this idea uh, of uh, dualism, that there is uh, a thinking thing, a mind that is immaterial. But you don't have to believe in an immaterial soul to believe in this kind of thing. And, for example, Lynn Rudder Baker has a view like this. And, in fact, McMahon has a view a bit like this, because McMahon says that we have... Um, egoistical concern about what he calls the isolated subject. I don't know if you remember in McMahon, he says, imagine that in the very advanced stages of Alzheimer's, uh, there's a conscious human being who has no psychological connections to anybody, to any uh, previous being. So, in other words, your memory is so degraded that you have no psychological links. They're not not even the lowest level of psychological connections. You were just awareness. It's as if you've come into existence for the first time. Presumably, you would have no language, no personality. It would have to be very extreme for this to be possible. But also, uh, perhaps more intuitive, is in the very early stages of your brain finally reaching uh, the capacity for consciousness, where it's just kind of flickering in like a light bulb. Like there will be like a, a moment of consciousness, of awareness, and then it would flicker out for a bit. That moment of awareness has no psychological connections with any person. 
Should we care about that? Should we care about these, these things that have consciousness but no connection, no, no relation R in Parfit's terms? Well, remember, for Parfit, relation R is what matters. It's the relation between stages that makes it the same person. So if there is no relation, then that's not me, according to the psychological account. But um, one, of the, uh, one of the famous critics of Parfit was, as I said, his frenemy, uh, Bernard Williams. And Bernard Williams gives this famous thought experiment where he says, um, imagine you're told two things. You're told, first of all, you're going to be tortured tomorrow. But second, before you're tortured, you're going to have your brain painlessly operated on so that all psychological connections to you right now are removed. And in place of all your personality and your memories are going to be Napoleon's personality and memories. And he says, uh, 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 so he says, if Parfit's theory is correct, you shouldn't fear the torture. Because, according to Parfit, there will be no relation R between the being that is tortured and you now. It'll be Napoleon, essentially, that's tortured. It'll be somebody else, if you take the psychological account. But, of course, what it seems like when we're given this thought experiment is, uh-oh, not only am I going to be tortured, but they're going to brainwash me as well. Two bad things are going to happen to me. So in other words, we identify with the person that's being tortured when we shouldn't, according to the psychological account. Why do ident we identify? Well, the explanation that someone like Lynn Rhoda Baker or even McMahon or Bernard Williams would say is that we're not uh, a set of memories and personalities. We're this experiencing subject that has the, uh, the memories and um, the memories and personality, but if that experiencing subject remains the same, everything about it can change, and it's still me. This is what Parfit would deny. Parfit would deny that he said. And one of the problems with this view, of course, is if nothing about the subject is the same, how can you tell it's the same subject? And that's the problem that uh, de Gracia focuses on with Lynn Rodder Baker, because she says uh, Lynn Rodder Baker allows for the possibility that um, I could not, I could, uh, I could exist without the human organism. And here is a is a good example that Lynn Rodder Baker uses, uh, and I think this is a powerful thought experiment too. She says. Imagine if, without me ever losing consciousness, my brain, every neuron in my brain is slowly replaced with an artificial one. So we work out, uh, you know, neurons, we, we get down to the level and we work out neurons are actually very simple things. They're just something that has a certain charge or it doesn't. Okay, but instead of a neuron made of organic matter, I'm going to replace it with a little switch or something made of, you know, unobtainium or, or something, um, uh, because that will never wear out. The thing about neurons is eventually they wear out and you, you, know, you get brain decay. Whereas I want a brain that will never decay. Okay, put this, uh, replace your neurons with something that will never degrade. Okay, so you replace them one by one over a period of years. And you never use con lose consciousness. But at the end of this process, and you, by the way, your cells are also being replaced too, the, the rest of your body, so that you're now data from Star Trek or something, uh, and you're, you'll, never, you'll never wear out. Uh, Baker would say, I, I continue to exist through this, but I'm no longer an organism. OK. Uh, that counts as an argument against animalism. If you believe, because uh, an animalist would have to say, at some point, when enough of me is artificial, you can't say that I'm an animal anymore, and because I am essentially an animal, I cease to exist. Whereas the person would say, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm still the same conscious person that I was five minutes ago. How come five minutes ago I was me, and, and now I'm not me? It seems to me that I persist through all of these things, even though now I'm mostly artificial. 
Um, so this is sort of an argument against the, f the idea that I'm essentially an animal. But of course, what it opens Baker, uh, Baker's view to the criticism of is, well, you say I'm a first person perspective. That's her term for, you know, point of view or, or sub persisting subject. But what is it that makes that? Uh, I mean, uh, McMahon says that I am a subject. So for example, McMahon says, I have reason to have ego concern about the isolated subject, this conscious entity at the end of Alzheimer's who is obviously not the same person as anybody that came before, just like the person who is tortured uh, tomorrow in, in Williams's example has no connection with me today. Uh, uh, McMahon is, uh, finds Williams's argument compelling and sort of says, okay, I, here's where I part ways with Parfit. You don't have to have relation R to have egoistic concern about that. So um, de Grazia takes McMahon to be on his side that, uh, that well, to take uh, McMahon to be on his side because although de Grazia doesn't say that we are an experiencing subject, he's an animalist, he says that the thought experiments um, that all of these guys do, starting with the prince and the cobbler with Locke, which he calls the, um, he refers to this method of arguing using thoughts, uh, thought experiments, the intuitive case method. Uh, he says what the intuitive case method uh, arrives at is something like that we are these Cartesian egos. It doesn't actually, when you look at all the examples, support Parfit's view, which is that we are persons that, we, that relation R counts because of Williams's um, clever torture example. And one of the things that Williams does is Williams says, okay, Prince and the Cobbler, if you present it one way, all the students or everybody who hears it says, oh yeah, they, they've switched bodies. But Williams complains, but that, it, it depends on the way that you described it. I can describe exactly the same circumstances, but if I describe it in the right way, then you won't think that the prince and the cobbler have switched bodies. If you say switch bodies, you are begging the question in favor of the idea that we're person. But if I describe it as imagine that uh, the prince's brain is worked on and he's all his memories and personality are removed and then he's reprogrammed to have memories identical to the ones that were had by the cobbler, then you're, if you describe it that way, you're much less likely to think that they're switched bodies and you're much more likely to have the animalist. Uh, view. So for this reason, someone like de Grazia says, if you rely on thought experiments to make your case, you're on shaky ground. This is why he doesn't like the intuitive case method and he wants to give arguments from a more metaphysical, you know, what kind of thing could we be? Uh, I don't know, I, it would be a shame if we can't use thought experiments because they're fun, but it is true. Uh, you've got to look very carefully at the, the language people are using when they come up with them. All right, so de Grazia's problem with Lynn Rudder Baker is this idea of the first person perspective. How can we tell that we have the same first person perspective? And he quotes her saying, we can just tell. And I think that's obviously false because it just seems to me that, you know, in the case of um, Parfit's teleport booth uh, occupant, uh, it's an entirely new person, but that for all they know, they have exactly the same point of view as even if they, they make 10 of them. All of the 10 different uh, clones that uh, pop up in different teleport booths, they would all think they have the same first person perspective. So you would get branching, whereas Lynn Rudderbaker seems to think you can rule that out. Uh, okay, so Lynn Rudderbaker's view is, uh, tries to come up with the, uh, an ingenious way to avoid some of these issues, but uh, it has its own problems. What does, um, what does de Gracia say about uh, McMahon? Well, we know that McMahon's, um, McMahon's view is the embodied mind view. So 
where he differs with, with Parfit is, he, is a, in a couple of respects. In one respect, it's harder, it's narrower than Parfit's because Parfit says if we teleport, the thing that arrives in the teleport booth, even though it's made of entirely new matter, relation R still holds with it in the original, so I should care about that person. McMahon gives a couple of ingenious examples, do you remember, where he talks about uh, the, the mission, uh, you know, there's a very dangerous mission, um, you've been cloned, and you get to decide who goes on the dangerous mission. You would pick the clone every time, whereas according to Parfit, you should have equal concern for both, because the clone and the original both have relation R to earlier version of you. So it shouldn't make any difference who goes on the dangerous mission, but of course it does. We think me, the original, is the real me, and that, um, you know, sorry, cloney, you're off to the war and I stay home safe. Uh, and similarly, McMahon, uh, so McMahon says, fewer things count as me in that respect. I, I don't survive teleportation. I have to have, relation R is important, but it has to be relation R carried by the original brain. But in other respects, um, McMahon is more generous. He says, uh, whereas Parfit would say the person in advanced stages of Alzheimer's is not me, or the, um, the fetus that is conscious but not self-conscious, because it's not a person but it is conscious, he would say mere consciousness is enough uh, for egoistic concern. So I identify with uh, the isolated subject, this uh, severe Alzheimer's patient who is conscious but not has no psychological connections to earlier ones, and also to the, the uh, newly conscious but not self-conscious fetus. So in, in, in some respects, uh, McMahon says, I have a longer lifespan than what Parfit would say, but I can't survive teleportation. Okay, now, um, uh, de Grazia refers to this view as mind essentialism. And here's what he says on page 68, 69. In what, in what he calls his embodied mind account, Jeff McMahon argues that we are essentially minded beings or minds. But minds, he argues, are or are caused by brains. Thus his mind essentialism says, suggests that we are essentially embodied minds, the parts of the brain that can be conscious. So not including the brain stem, because the brain stem is not part of what makes the brain conscious. Accordingly, the criterion of personal identity is the continued existence and functioning in non-branching form of enough of the same brain to be capable of generating consciousness or mental activity. Um, now, an advantage of this that uh, is one of the key disadvantages of the animalism view so these are the objections to personalism, but animalism has its objections too. And the key one, one of the key ones that people like McMahon press is imagine I have, you got the prince and the cobbler, uh, but instead of somehow mysteriously their consciousness is swapping, you literally just open the tops of their head and take out their cerebrum, not even the whole brain. Because if you take out the whole brain, then an animalism could, because here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the cerebrum and swap them. Now, just about everybody is going to say the prince is now in, in the cobbler's body, which again counts against can, uh, animalism. What animalism could try to do is they say, well, actually, you know, a, a whole brain by itself, if you lose in a, uh, if, if you, it, you could count as an animal that has lost extraneous parts. So for example, an animalist can say, well, obviously animals can lose parts. If you lose your arm, you're still the same animal. I mean, starfish can lose arms all the time and regrow them. They can, you know, you can chop a starfish down fairly significantly and it remains the same starfish. So animals don't have to retain all of the same body. And an animalist can say, maybe the minimum they have to count to still be the same animal is the whole brain. But it has to be the whole brain, because one of the reasons that they can even make this move of claiming that a brain counts as an animal 
is that the brain stem is what does most of the regulating functions. Because this notion of an animal is of an organism where all the bits work together. It's a sort of, the reason why um, Van Inwagen, Van Inwagen, um, very briefly, he, uh, he wrote this book that's very influential in metaphysics called Material Beings. I think that's the title. Where in it he argues that there are no such things as objects. This uh, is not an object. Objects don't exist. The only things that exist are uh, most basic particles that make up stuff. So this is just a swarm of particles. That's what it is. It's a collection of particles. It is not itself a real thing. Now, the arguments for and against this, you'd have to take a whole metaphysics class. His one exception, he says, the, uh, so that all that exists is, is basic particles and organisms. Well, why do organisms exist as objects when this is not an object? And the answer is, because they have this weird property of, uh, of making a system. An organism is a system working as a unit. So that gives them a kind of unity that this doesn't. This doesn't have things working as a unit. It's just a bunch of particles that happen to be adjacent to each other. There's no, there's no internal unity. Whereas with an organism, there is a, an internal unity and, uh, and it can take in new particles and, and lose old ones and still be the same thing. So what Olsen takes from this is actually an answer to the corpse problem. Um, so, uh, well, before I get to that, um, the cerebrum transplant. So the reason why it's just a cerebrum um, as the criticism rather than the whole brain, because if you had the whole brain, then the animalist can say, well, yes, it's true. The prince is now over here where the cobbler, uh, with the cobbler's arms and legs, because really the prince is uh, an animal and a whole brain is the, the minimal animal. But if you take away the brainstem, you can't even claim that because the brainstem is what does the organizing. So if it's just the cerebrum, the thing that, that has consciousness, then the animalist can't claim that you know, the, what counts as the animal for the prince has moved because the brainstem is the important part for them because of this organizing feature. So the cerebrum transplant is a real counterintuitive claim because what the animalist has to say is that the thing in the prince's body that thinks it's the, uh, the cobbler is still the prince. It's just deluded. And de Grazia sticks, sticks to his guns. Uh, one of the useful things about his, um, his chapter is at the end of it, he runs through uh, a bunch of cases. And one of them is the cerebrum transplant. And he says, suppose you have a cerebrum transplant so that your cerebrum is now in somebody else's body. Where are you? Everybody except the hardcore animalists are going to say you're over in this new body because it, it, it thinks it's you. It's, see, as far as you're concerned, you were aware pretty much the whole time. Things went black for a while and he said, what's happening, what's happening, until they connected you up to the, the eyes in the other person and you, you could suddenly see and now you're looking through the eyes of this new person. But what an animalist has to say and what de Grazia says is you survive as the original body. Uh, now, yeah, even if you if they take your cerebrum out and they don't put a new one in this body, you're still the body. So you are now an unthinking thing. The person who has your cerebrum falsely believes that she is you. So you don't exist over there. And that just seems very counterintuitive. That's a problem for the animalist view. I think that's a fatal problem. Uh, the corpse problem, I'm less moved by, but here it is. It's, it's a bit like the fetus prob uh, problem, the what happens to the fetus. If, the problem, if you are a personal essentialist and you say, I pop into existence when a baby becomes conscious, well, what happens to the organism that wasn't self-conscious that existed all this time? What happened to it? Did it stop, to, stop existing? Uh, where'd it go? 
the corpse problem is kind of in, on the inverse. If, uh, because animalists say, I am essentially a living thing. So when do I cease to exist? When I die. Notice that's what, literally anima, the root means alive. Um, so if I'm a living organism, then I cease to exist when I die. Well, but there's this dead thing there. What's that? It's not me. Uh, so, for example, animalists would say, can't really say we're burying great aunt Ethel uh, after she's died. We would, they would have to say we're burying great aunt Ethel's remains. Great aunt Ethel is gone. She, she ceased to exist when she died. Uh, but there's this, you know, inconvenient object that still exists, the corpse, that we then have to deal with. And what um, Olson would say is that's not even really an object. It's just the particles that made up Great Aunt Ethel. But once the animal stops, and remember the special thing, according to Van Einwagen for organisms, is there is this system. But when you die, the system stops existing. There's, it no longer takes in new things. It's no longer regulating or anything. It's just a bunch of stuff now. Uh, so there's not even an object there. Uh, so it's not really a problem. I don't have to explain why there's a pile of stuff there. You know, there's stuff everywhere. Another huge problem for animalism is the two persons, one animal, and uh, the famous example that uh, McMahon mentions in this book, even, which was written before de Grazia's book, there's de Grazia's book, um, uh, is this case of, um, is it dicephalus? Yes, that would mean two heads, um, which is uh, Abigail and Brittany Hensel, who are conjoined twins that have basically one torso and the rest of their body, and um, uh, they have two conscious heads growing out of them. This is an extreme case of dicephalus. Uh, it's described in de they're described in detail on page 286, their case. Um, he gives some details that are kind of amazing. Although they have two hearts, two esophagi, and two stomachs, they share three lungs, a single liver, a single small intestine, a single large intestine, and a single urinary, circulatory, immunological, and reproductive system. And as he adds, so that any child they might conceive would have three persons as parents, a father and two mothers, because the womb is shared by both Abigail and Brittany Hensel. So it's a, a remarkable um, organization that's gone on there. Clearly, uh, they were a cell that was going to divide as normal identical twins do divide, but it didn't fully divide. It just partly divided and they lived as, uh, as sometimes happens. And uh, the problem, of course, for animalism is animalism says we are essentially organisms. Well, that's one organism. It's one system. But uh, what persons would say, but there are two people there. Whereas an animalist say, has to say, there's one of us, one kind of thing. A hu there's one human animal, so there's only one of us, one of them. Whereas uh, Abigail and Brittany want to say, no, there's two of us. We're two different ones. So if there's only one animal and there's two of them, then they can't both be identical to the animal because they're not identical to each other. Abigail, is, A does not equal B. So both of them can't equal this third thing, the, the organism. They cannot be identical with it. So neither of them can therefore be identical with the organism. But of course, animalism says we are identical with an organism. So that's a problem for animalism. What de Grazia says uh, in response to this is he very briefly says, this is uh, one of those rare cases of two overlapping organisms. So he wants to argue that there are actually two organisms there, and they just happen to overlap. But they, uh, the, the way they can make this case, and, and, and um, Campbell and McMahon quote other animalists saying this, is the duplication, there is some duplication of organisms. So there, there's enough of 
their own organisms, for example, they share two esophagi, uh, they have two esophagi, one each, that you can say, well, really, there's two distinct organisms that in theory are separable and could function separately. Um, which is why McMahon, in response, comes up with even more ingenious uh, and strange cases of conjoined. Uh, but that certainly seems to be a problem for, um, uh, for animalism. Before I finish with de Grazia, um, uh, his criticism of McMahon's embodied, um, embodied mind view, one problem is uh, there's a version of um, the fetus or PBS problem because McMahon does say, oh, uh, there's two parts to this. There's embodied, so we're brains, but mind, we're minds. So a non-functioning brain is not us. So if, uh, if, if a brain dies, then we are not there anymore. So then you've got a version of the corpse problem. We're there where this uh, brain uh, existing and functioning and being conscious, but if it dies, what's that thing that's there? If we were a brain, well, we're not that. Well, where did that come from then? So the distinction between functional brains and mere brains is a problem for McMahon, and he takes it up in the article.